Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as many of you know, if you walk through uh, uh, this with us at all um, over uh, since uh, the beginning of, um, of um, August, we have been looking at Matthew's gospel. We're taking the whole year looking at one gospel. And Matthew's gospel is 28 chapters long. And right at the dead center is sort of the hinge of the gospel where the focus goes from uh, the, the first 16 chapters are, who is this man, Jesus? Who is he? And just a few weeks ago, we, we saw where his full identity, of course, last week as well, as we saw Jesus transformed into his divine glory on top of the mountain, that question was answered for us. He is the Messiah, the one we have long waited for. Fully man, yes, but also fully God in one person, the great mystery of that. And so now the rest of the gospel is dedicated to answering the question, well, if that's who Jesus is, then why did he come? Why did he come? And so as we'll hear, he came to die for us sinners. But before that, on this, on this, uh, this uh, journey, we go from a high place to a low place. We go from a place of, um, of uh, seeing Jesus in, in all of his glory on top of the mountain where he comes down to find his disciples failing him. Now, I think we often use hyperbole and big statements in our culture all the time. Like this is the most difficult thing I've ever done or this is the, this is the most delicious food I've ever had or whatever it is. But I am not kidding you when I say that in 16 years of ordained ministry, and, I, and in fact, my first funeral sermon was somebody that was murdered, right? So I have had some really tough sermons, some tough issues to work on. But I am not speaking hyperbolically when I say that, for, that I have wrestled with this text more than any other text that I've wrestled with in 16 years. So... Hopefully, we will leave not too con con confused, but one thing that I will tell you on the outset is that if you're looking for really simple answers out of this text, you probably won't get them. Because a lot of what Christ says here is perplexing to our minds. Now, why is that? Why am I wrestling so much with this text? Well, maybe while you heard it being read, maybe something gripped your heart. Or maybe two things gripped your heart. The first one was Jesus, the great lover of our souls, looks at his disciples and says, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with, with you? How long am I to bear with you? Well, thanks, Jesus. <laughs> right? And then, if that wasn't enough, when his disciples come to him and say, why couldn't we heal this boy of his demon, which is manifesting itself as an illness, he said, it's because you didn't have enough faith. You didn't have any faith. It's your fault. Or so it seems. So what do we do with this text? What do we do with this text? Well, as I dived into it and as I really immersed myself in it, read all these different things on it, I do believe this. The text means what it says. I used to be a lawyer, right? Many of y'all know that. And of course, what, what do lawyers do? We, we take what a law clearly says and we twist it to make it say what we want it to, to, to us say, mainly to our client's best interest, right? But I'm not a lawyer anymore. It's not my job. My job is not to take this test and, or, or this text and twist it and mold it into something which is acceptable or which sort of feeds into what I want. My, my job is to help us put ourselves underneath this text and submit to it and grow in it and find Christ in it and, and find ourselves in it. So after I've immersed myself, Lord, what are you really telling us here? I believe that this text says what it, what it says, and so therefore it's deeply challenging. But it's also deeply comforting. As deep is, as the challenge is on us, I would say that even deeper is the comfort that our Savior shows to us sinners. So with that, I'm going to dive in first with the challenge here. 
with the challenge here. Um, just so you know, um, you can find the same story in Mark's gospel and in Luke's gospel. Um, they're all part of what are called the synoptic gospels. That's just Greek for they're all kind of look the same, okay? Um, but each one of these authors is writing to a, to a different audience. And so if you want a more complete, sort of a more fleshed out description of, of what's happening in the story, go to Mark 9. But here, what Matthew's doing when he takes this um, story is he wants it to particularly focus not on the father, not on the child, but on the disciples, on those who will follow Jesus after his resurrection and ascension and take the gospel out into to, to the world. And if you have proclaimed Christ, if you put your trust in Christ as your savior, then you are a disciple. And so therefore, this message is for us. So what is the problem here? Well, once again, what's happened, Jesus is coming off the Mount of, of, uh, of uh, Transfiguration, um, and he comes back to find his, his disciples. People have been bringing his, his disciples, people that needed to be healed. Of course, they've been doing this. Jesus has been, been doing this for, for a long while now. But what he finds is that his disciples are completely in, in Ineffective. Though back in chapter 10, we heard that he gave them authority to cast out demons in his name. It's not working. And Jesus gets frustrated with them. Now, once again, we're in the mystery of Jesus being fully God and fully man. So his frustration is not a sin. He's, he's, it's not inappropriate for him to, to be frustrated with them. But he's certainly wearing it out there, right? I'll get back to it. To that when we talk about comfort, believe it or not. But of course, Jesus goes and rebukes the demon and it leads him. And then his disciples come to him quietly and say, Lord, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, because of your little faith, which is really a um, idiom, which just means no faith. Because you had no faith in, in my power. For truly, I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from, from there, and it will move, for nothing will be impossible to you. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying that his disciples, who did not yet have the benefit of the resurrection or the ascension, that it wasn't that they kind of believed Jesus could, could do it. It's like, let me just sort of, I've got this faith, let me just muster it up and build it up, and, 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 and then the power is in me to heal you. What Jesus is saying is that you, you disciples had zero faith that I could ever do it. Maybe you were acting out of, uh, out of just sheer for, formality, whatever it is, but the reason why I did not release my power through you is you did not believe that I could actually do it. So here we have this really mysterious and strange connection be between having faith, period, right? Because Jesus says even if you're just a mustard seed, the smallest seed that, that they knew of in Christ's day was, was, the, was the mustard seed, the size of a grain of sand. Even if you had that much faith in what I could, could, could do, I could work powerfully through you. So, of course, what we have here as confusing as it might be, is this connection between our faith and our ability to actually do God's work in the world. Well, whenever I get stuck on things, I always go to, to my commentaries, but my favorite is my, is, is, is my um, spiritual mentor, J.C. Ryle. He died 150 years ago, had great vi Victorian-like hand chops on the side of his face, but, but, but an absolute pastor. This is what he says on this verse. Let us ponder this point well and learn wisdom. Faith is the key to success in the Christian warfare. Unbelief is a sure road to defeat. Once let our faith languish and decay and all our graces will languish with it. Courage, patience, long-suffering and hope will soon wither and dwindle away. And then, and then this is the part that I want to focus on. Faith is the root on which they all depend. So in some mysterious way, faith is the root, is the avenue by which God works 
through us. Now, as I reflected on, on this, um, I think this quote is true for two reasons. What is this connection? What is this root con- con- connection? And I came up with these two reasons, which, which I found incredibly helpful, and I hope that, that you do too. And once again, to kind of step back and state the obvious, I mean, many of you are thinking out there, well, this is crazy. Because are you saying that when I prayed for myself to be healed and I wasn't healed because I didn't have faith? When I prayed for my friend or my loved one or my child or my, or my parent or whoever it might be to be healed or be healed spiritually or physically or whatever it might be and they weren't healed, it's because I didn't have faith? Well, I don't think it's that simple. Because the Lord will move in his own time in his own way. But yet, what we're focusing on here is not someone who didn't have enough faith, as if there's like some 80% per- percent quota before your, of, of a faith measurement before your prayer's answered. It's that the disciples here had no faith, zero faith. And so what are the two reasons why I think Ryle's right that we need to have faith as the root of all of our ability to exercise God's work in this world? Well, the first one is this. I don't, I believe after reading the whole of, of the scriptures that God won't act if he's never asked to act. God won't act if he's never asked to act. Likewise, God won't act if he doesn't get the glory. Let me explain. Um, just yesterday, um, Nell uh, Daniels and I, you'll hear from, from Nell later, had the opportunity to do a Zoom call um, or, or, uh, with, with our dear friends in, uh, in Nicaragua at Orphan Network. We uh, pray for them every Sunday. They are our uh, international ministry partner. And I have never known anyone that's faced as many obstacles to ministry as our dear brothers and sisters down there. As, as many of you know, we partner with an organization which partners with a local church down there. And yes, they, they do the fullness of God's mission. They feed starving children, they give them health care, and they, and they proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins, real life in his life, and they invite these people to come and know him. It's not tied to, to the food. You don't have to check a box, but all these things are, are being offered. But they're doing it in, in a country which is in, underneath incredible political pressure. There a president, Daniel Ortega, is a dictator. Um, he has a, he's manipulated every election. He is an, he is an autocrat. And he absolutely fears Western intervention in his country. And so therefore, he sees any missionary societies in Nicaragua which receive funds from the U.S. as an enemy. And he puts up incredibly tight strictures and and, and, uh, boundaries on them. Every month, they have to refile all this paperwork. And if they don't get it just right, or even if they do get it just right... They'll, they'll pull it and they can't receive any foreign funds. As we'll hear, five to ten um, nonprofits that do good work in that country are being shut down by the government. But, but between COVID and two hurricanes hitting them over two years, massive flooding, they're in incredible fi- financial strains. And then, of course, COVID itself, they don't have the same safeguards we do. They don't have the same vaccine uh, opportunities that that we do. They have had the whole world against them. Every obstacle is being thrown up in their way. And so as we're sitting there listening to them, we see the two leaders that we're talking to, Eddie Morales and uh, and, uh, David Gutierrez, they're just sitting there smiling at us. As we're so worried about there, we're so worried, oh, good Lord, Satan's throwing all these things at you and what's going on. And and we're all very, we're all very American and very serious. We're going to solve this problem, right? Right in and solve it. And they're just smiling at us. You crazy gringos. You don't know. Because they say, well, we've prayed. We trust the Lord. 
We've asked him to come and, and remove all these obstacles, and we've asked him to give us wisdom to get around these obstacles, and we've asked them to do things that, that you know, we just did, that are just impossible by our minds, but, 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 but we trust him. And what they're doing there, where they're not like the disciples, is I believe that the disciples believe that the power was inside of them in some way. That, it, that, that they could heal them, right? That God's anointing was just sort of to sort of pass on the power. Now they could act in their own name and act in their own uh, wisdom and try to cast out these, uh, these uh, demons by, by the strength of their own hearts, if you will. But what our dear friends are doing is, is, is they're doing the opposite. Is they're saying, Lord, they're, they're these huge, massive problems. I can't wait to watch you do what you're going to to do. I'm going to give you in my prayer, Lord, I'm going to lay these down, these things out in front of your feet, and I'm going to give you the chance to do something that only you could do. And so therefore, I think that, that, that the Lord seizes that opportunity and works through it. Likewise, not only does God work through it, but now God gets the glory. They cannot, they are so full of praise and thanksgiving that makes us embarrassed in all of our wealth and all of our blessings and all of our benefits. Their joy in the Lord outweighs ours by any measurement. Because they give God an opportunity to show his glory because they just lay it out there. And so when he moves mountains, they rejoice in him. They're amazed by him. And then guess what happens? Their faith begins to build. Do they have setbacks? Do, do they get whatever they want whenever they, they want it? No. They've had staff members die of COVID. Um, they've had massive obstacles. Uh, once again, you'll hear more about that uh, later, about the obstacles that they've had to overcome. They've had heartbreak on top of heartbreak. But yet they know that the Lord is working even in those So, of course, this begs the question, how do we get this kind of faith, right? How do we become the kind of people that aren't these kinds of disciples? How do we become the kinds of people who, um, who uh, are, are like our dear brothers and sisters in, uh, in a Nicaragua? Well, the answer is the greatest comfort. The greatest comfort. You see, faith... And, and I meant to say this on the outset. I think we get faith and trust. We see those as two different things. When actually in, in the scriptures, the word faith is synonymous with trust. Wherever it says faith, just put in trust. And I think for our purposes, in our culture, that's better. Because we tend to reduce faith down to intellectual ascent, right? Do you have faith in something? Well, okay, well, let me learn about it, and, I'll, and, and if I intellectually agree with that, then I will say that I have faith in that, right? Uh, I understand it. I understand its ins and outs. I've weighed the pros and cons. Now I have faith in that. But the problem is, is that's too analytical. Information is important in faith, but it's not the heart of faith because it's too analytical, and now we keep God at arm's length. Trust is different, isn't it? Trust in it isn't as much of an act of the mind as it is an act of the, of the will. It's a, it's a choice, love. Trust is a choice. When you trust someone, you maybe have made a bunch of assumptions about what, whether they're trustworthy or not. Sometimes you don't even get the chance. Sometimes you just have to trust them because you have to trust them. And so the heart of good faith, the heart of, of real faith, is trusting in God. Now, of course, how do we trust in God if we don't know him? What's his character? Who is he? Well, he tells us right here, and he also acts it out. Once again, after this, why do you think Jesus, for the second time, tells them his uh, mission right after they failed him? Listen to what Christ says, verse verse. Uh, uh, 22, as they were gathering in uh, Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man, which is his favorite term for himself, is about to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. 
And again, they were greatly distressed because they just didn't understand this. So how do we understand this? Well, let's look at how Christ treated these people who frustrated him so much. How do we want to treat people who frustrate us? And why was Christ frustrated with them? Because if anybody had the right amount of knowledge about who he was and, and what he could, could do, it was his 12 disciples. They had been following him for years at this point. They had watched him do miracle after miracle after miracle. They had actually gone out on a mission trip, two by two, and cast out demons without one problem. They were not, they were without excuse. They had all the information in, in in front of them, and their failure of faith was solely on their own hearts. And how does Jesus Christ respond to people like that? Because if we're honest, many of us in this room, is that not the way we are? We have, by God's grace, been shown from maybe the earliest days of our lives, his love for us, his grace for us. We have stories of healing. We have stories of spiritual healing. We've seen it happen in other people's lives. We've seen it happen in our own lives. We, we've seen it happen through this church. And yet, we remain faithless. Does he fire us? Does he throw us out? It's about to make a Donald Trump joke there, but it's probably not right to do that, right? You're, you're fired. He doesn't pull, pull that card out, right? He loves them. He loves them. And, and I think the reason why he voiced his frustration with, with them and us is to, so that we would, might get a great measurement of how great that his love is. Because what does he do with them? He does rebuke them absolutely. But then he instructs them and, and he encourages them and he says, continue to follow me. Disciples, your great failure here has not disqualified you from my love or my service. In fact, your great failure here is one more opportunity for you to come to know my love and my sacrifice for, for you and why you should trust me all the more. Is that not comforting for those of us who blow it on a daily, sometimes hourly basis with our Lord and those around us who don't just have little faith, sometimes we have no faith, zero faith. And his response to us is, trust me. Know I love you. I will not abandon you. I will not forsake you. Continue to to follow me. And as we focus on that, you see, here's, here's the application. As we focus on that, focus on his great love for us, focus on the sacrifice for, for us, focus on the fact that he is a holy, just God whose sin should evaporate in his very presence. Yet he brings us sin incarnate up to himself and says, you're my, my beloved. And the more that we dwell on that, the more that we learn he's trustworthy, he's powerful, he loves us, and then that has this positive spiral, if you will, this upward spiral, this, this holy cascading event where faith is built up in our hearts. Let me end with these two, two things. If you read this account in Mark's gospel, it focuses more on the, on the father because he's part of this charge of being a faithless and worthless generation. And the father has these words, which I just think are my words every moment of every day. And he's sitting there listening and he watches his son get, get, get healed. And he says, Jesus, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. I believe. Now help me in my unbelief. And so if you're visiting this day and maybe you've heard about Jesus and, and you've rejected him because the church has hurt you, because pastors have hurt you or because Christians have hurt you, or maybe you're just mad at God. Maybe because you feel like that he failed you in a time like this, Father, where the healing didn't come. Maybe that's, that's you and, and you're here and, and, and maybe you are curious. 
how do you start to have faith? You start by looking at the depth to which Jesus Christ loves you and me while we're at our worst and will never abandon us and will never let us go. Start there. Start there. I'd love to talk to you more about it. It's why I do what I do. You're not bothering me. I'd love to talk to you about that. But then there are those of us who have been following Christ for us some time. Maybe we're frustrated by the ineffectiveness of our prayers. Well, the rebuke to people like that, which is me, and which might be some of you out there, is Jesus says, look more deeply into my love. Trust me, even with the mustard seed of faith that I can do the impossible. Give me a chance to show up by asking me sincerely to show up. Give me a chance for me to show you how powerful I am by asking me to show up and show you how powerful that I am. What's one situation in your life right now where you just don't think God has the power to heal even that? That's the place where where we go to our knees and say, Lord, do this mighty work and I'll sit back and I'll watch you do it. I believe, but help me in my unbelief. And this is good news for us sinners indeed. Amen.